Right to be Read podcast, episode number 43. Interview with Sean Platt. You are listening to the Right to be Read podcast, and this is your host, Ani Alexander. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Right to be Read podcast. I'm your host, Dani Alexander, and today again, I'm bringing you content which will hopefully inspire and encourage you. In case you wonder what to do after writing the book, I've created an ebook which will uh, give answers to that question and will help you with your upcoming steps to move forward and become an author. Just go to www.annialexander.com slash free and download the book. It's waiting for you there. So uh, what we will have today? Today I'm going to have an interview with Sean Platt. Sean Platt is an author entrepreneur. He's the founder of Sterling and Stone and co-founder of the Collective Inkwell and Real Monsanto Imprints. He's also the co-host of the self-publishing podcast. I'm really excited to have him over here and I'm absolutely sure that you'll enjoy the interview. Before we go deep into writing and self-publishing and other related topics, I would like you, Sean, to tell us how did you get involved in writing? What did you do before and how did you end up becoming a writer? Um, well, before I, I owned some flower shops in Long Beach, California. And after that, I had a preschool with my wife. And then I just started writing mostly to entertain myself. And then I thought, well, this is kind of awesome. I'll try this more professionally. And um, we closed our preschool because I thought I would be an awesome writer. But I was totally, totally um, put the cart before the horse and um, absolutely thoroughly failed my first couple of years online. And I was writing a lot of keyword articles and just garbage, mucky stuff that was slowly killing me. And then I learned to, um, I became a, a, a ghostwriter and did a lot of uh, marketing and copy stuff, uh, which taught me, you know, gave me the basic tool set that I have now, which is I write fast, I write well, and I have kind of a, a, a key understanding of human behavior and marketing, which kind of helps me bake that into the stories that I make. Well, that's neat. So you kind of, you know, uh, learned on clients' works <laughs> to do uh, much better work for yourself later on, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I was I was building a lot of products for people, doing a lot of email autoresponders, that kind of thing, and I got to see exactly what worked and what didn't. And so, you know, it was it was natural to carry that over to my own business. And by the time, I guess it was 2011, mid-2011, uh, Kindle was just blowing up. And I thought, you know what? I don't ever want to write for anybody other than myself ever again. And so it was very, very risky. And it was at a time when I had just finally pulled myself out of all the damage that I had created for myself by, um, by you know, overzealously going online to start writing uh, without a safety net. And I was finally out of the danger, and then I just hopped right back into it, basically. Ah, uh, I see. So, uh, do I remember correctly that you also had a blog for freelance writers? Uh, yeah, I did. For for actually, I had two different ones. I had um, I had one called Ghostwriter Dad, which was basically just a SEO based. And the only reason that blog existed was because I wanted to rank for the term ghostwriter and get business from search engines, which worked really well. Um, and that's where most of my business, um, uh, my business would either come from search engine results or I would guest post on, um, on copy blogger and my phone would ring, you know, every time I did. And I, I think I wrote 24 guest posts over a couple year period for copy blogger. And so that, that kept the business pretty healthy. And, um, uh, then I had another another blog after I shut Ghostwriter Dad down that was called The Digital Writer, and it was much more sophisticated. Um, it had you know smart email marketing, a, a really good curation element, and, and it was it was it was awesome. But I I just didn't like it, <laughs> so I shut it down. Even though it was doing very well, I just I shut it down, and that was when I started. Um, when I started, when I started uh, writing fiction full time, 
And what's interesting about that is that I, I actually love the idea of helping writers. Um, I love all of that, but I didn't like spending so much time um, writing in that way. I wanted to spend all my writing time writing fiction. And so um, it was just, it was kind of unrewarding. Like I would spend like t- probably 10 hours a week writing for the site, another 10 hours answering questions in an email. And it had nothing to sell. Like the site was just me being nice. Mm-hmm. And um, so it was dramatically impacting the amount of fiction that I could write. Um, it was doing nothing for my bottom line. And all in all, like if I'm being honest and I hate saying this, but I felt like the the audience was pretty unappreciative. And you know, I was, I was just doing something to be nice. And so, um, I thought that the cost was too high. And as much as I liked, um, helping writers and answering questions and doing all of that, it just, it was too expensive, Mm -hmm. um, for nothing in return. And so, um, what I love now is that I, I, the, the self-publishing podcast, it really scratches that same itch for me. I get to help writers. I get to talk about what I'm doing. Um, and it, it, it's in that environment. It's a nonfiction environment. But it's just so much easier to manage. Um, there's still a lot of email. We still get a lot of questions and, and, and that. But the actual writing time, it, it's not, it doesn't exist. Because I just show up with Dave and Johnny each week. And we just talk. And it's really fun because I like talking. I like talking with my friends. And I like helping. And so I can do all of those things. And the end result is the same as the blog. It helps the writers who are part of the audience. But the time spend isn't just less. It's really definable. I can say, okay, it's this hour or this hour and a half, or let's be real, a lot of times it's two hours. It's two hours every Friday. And and so there's not a lot of surprises there. And it's just, it's easier to scale. Um, and, and I like that a lot. Okay, so it, it's it's very interesting you said that because I had a self development blog for two years, which I sold before starting the podcast because I wanted to concentrate on on one thing and um, you know have better results and working on on one project at a time. And I realized that somehow, at least for me, that that what was coming uh, first of all the time, as you said, you know, you're spending less time on this and less effort and you're getting I, somehow I have a feeling that I'm getting more engagement and more intimate relationship with my listeners. Rather oh, than- I, I get way, way, way more. Um, the, the, our, our podcast audience is awesome. Like they're just the most awesome, fantastic people. Um, you know, we had our, our fiction unbox thing and we did a Kickstarter and we funded in 11 hours and that would never, ever, ever, ever have happened with my previous on my previous audience. I felt like that audience just they kind of took and took and took and they never really gave back. And I was never asking for money. I was asking for things like social shares and um, and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. But that never, ever existed. People like I would put something up and I would say, here, just this is this is a free download. I, I just I would appreciate it if you would share it. And we'd get 10,000 downloads and like 14 shares. Yeah. And I'm like, you guys suck. And so. <laughs> This audience is the opposite. This audience is really, really just warm and generous and giving. And so it makes me want to be warm and generous and giving. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's it's just a mutual cooperation. And, you, you, you know, at, at some point when you're not getting the feedback, you end up, you know, not having the right motivation. And, uh, and you know, it, it's normal that eventually you just give it up. So since you mentioned the fiction unboxed and it's like something completely new and interesting and um, many people were talking about that and it was a huge success, can you briefly explain what it was and what you did and what results did you get? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's probably the coolest thing we've done this year. Um, and it's awesome because it was not on the calendar. Uh, Fiction Unbox was not supposed to exist. Um, at the end of last year, the three of us, mostly me and Johnny, um, wrote a book called uh, Write, Publish, Repeat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it was just kind of – it was like the podcast but linear because we're really off topic on the podcast and we kind of meander all over the place. And Write, Publish, Repeat was the book that our audience wanted us to write um, that kind of – said a lot of the stuff that we had talked about in the podcast, but just in in a more logical order that was more of a reference material that they could go over. 
Um, the book was long though. It was 120,000 words and it, it didn't have room for the producti- productivity part that we wanted to put at the end. Uh, mm-hmm. And so we realized, you know, people kept asking us, well, okay, that's great that you write all those words, but how do you do it? And so we just didn't really want to write another nonfiction book because they're not as much fun <laughs> as writing fiction books. And so we had, we figured, okay, well, we'll write that, you know, at the end of the year, which would have been like right now. Right now is about the time that we would be finishing that book. It's a full year later after write, publish, repeat. And now, now makes sense. But at the time, we didn't want to, so we thought, why not just show them instead? And the whole um, premise of Fiction Unboxed was, we'll come to the table with no no idea, no book, no genre, nothing, and we'll just kind of make it up. And um, and that worked really, really well. Um, it was scary. It was totally, totally <laughs> scary because we really had no safety net. Uh, we really, I mean, you could see it on day three that we have no idea, um, you know, and, and, and all like Johnny and, and Dave just hated my ideas <laughs> and we had to like, you know, we had to make an extra video that day. We had to have a second meeting after I had a, a long walk to get some new ideas and it was scary. But the whole point was that we were trying to prove that, you know, one of the lines, my favorite lines in write, publish, repeat is people ask us where we get such good ideas. And we argue that we don't get good ideas. We make ideas good. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think that's a really important distinction. And I think that's what we tried very hard to prove during Fiction Unboxed was just that it's just a matter of sitting down and telling the story and then telling it over and over and over again, making it better each time. And that that can start from anywhere. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's it's a very encouraging experience when people um, see that, uh, you know, quite successful writers also get problem of getting the ideas on time. And uh, they they also have very similar struggles, actually. So it's, it's not like, you know, those writers who are just starting have these issues just because they are newbie writers. Everyone gets uh, this problem with ideas once in a while and I think it's very important that you know you kind of you show the real picture that it happens and also you showed how the solution can come up as well so it's it's really I think it was very original and nice idea and I I can understand why it was so successful yeah it was it was scary for sure um but it was it was just it was really really awesome and um, it, it birthed a lot of cool things that we've done since. Um, we, we had our first ever Story World Summit, uh, which was um, which was last month in Austin. And Dave and Johnny came out with with a few other attendees, and we kind of mapped out what we were going to do for the sequel, mm-hmm. and you know, to build a bigger a bigger world. And that's really exciting. And we did the whole thing with open source fiction, which which is really cool. It means that the world that we created. Within that context, um, anybody can write. Anyone who was a part of the Fiction Unbox project can write in that world and publish their stuff to Amazon and collect all the royalties. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> well, actually, when you started the Fiction Unbox, you already had your audience and you already had your fans because you know this project was. Uh, funded on Kickstarter and you had validated the idea kind of. Uh, what about in the very beginning when your audience is still small uh, and you're just building it up? I know that with fiction, it's a bit more difficult to get audience and to get especially this audience engaged. How did you do that? What? How did you manage that in the very beginning? Um, well, we did something really risky, which doesn't seem risky at the time because a lot of people have done it since. But at the time, it was everyone told us we were stupid and it was going to fail and we suck and <laughs> what do we know? And that was that we did serialized fiction um, uh-huh. on Kindle. And um, everybody said nobody wants their books chopped into parts. And we agree. Nobody does want their books chopped into parts. But we also agree that nobody wants their movies chopped into parts. But that doesn't mean that Breaking Bad isn't very successful. Mm-hmm. Right? It's not – we're not chopping a movie into, or a book into parts. We're, we're building individual episodes and creating a new experience 
mm-hmm. in digital reading platforms. And so to communicate that, we changed a lot of the language and we didn't call our stuff books. We called them episodes and seasons. And when we would have six episodes done, we would bundle it together in a season and that immediately communicated to readers what um, what kind of experience they could expect. And that made a really, really big difference. And again, this doesn't seem like that novel an idea now because if you go on Amazon, there's a lot of episodes yeah. and seasons. Mm-hmm. But but to our knowledge, no one had done that before us. Um, okay. And, so, and, and what you did mainly was you were giving out the first episode for free and hooking up the readers and then selling the, the other ones? Well, that's that's long term. That's what we tried to do. But actually, no, we couldn't do that because Amazon doesn't allow you to price for free. Um, we can only price for 99 cents. Now, we always try to get our first episode free just because it makes sense to do that. But but no, we just we priced it at 99 cents. Okay, I see. So so you have many different series by now, right? It's uh, how many do you have? Um, enough that I'm embarrassed to say, I don't even know how many, um, over, over 10, um, including comedies, actually probably closer to 15, a and, lot. <laughs> and, and how many episodes per series approximately? Um, we, we write in six episode, not everything we have is a serial, but on the serial stuff, there are six episodes per season. And, um, most of our stuff is still pretty early. Uh, we have two seasons of White Space and Available Darkness, one season, oh, and The Beam, one season of a lot of other things. And then our most developed series is Yesterday's Gone, which is the most mature. It's just longest time on market. And it's um, it has five seasons. Mm-hmm. And uh, what's the approximate word count per episode? I mean, I'm just trying to understand the volume of the thing. <laughs> it, it totally, totally depends on the... Um, um, on, on the book, on the series, uh-huh. um, <laughs> yesterday's gone is about 25,000 for nevermore and white space or 15,000 robot proletariat's about 12,000 and, um, the beam is almost 30,000. So it totally depends on the project. Okay. I see. Well, I mean, apparently like it's a huge volume of, of writing. And yeah, special- we've, we've published, uh, in the last three years or so we've published about 5 million words. Yeah, it's like enormous. So, uh, which which makes me think about. I mean, the question just pops up immediately. Like, you know, how do you stay so prolific? Um, well, we uh, um, <laughs> one of the questions we're asked very very often is, um, well, how do you create such quality with such volume? And the question is always asked as if the two are mutually exclusive. But I would actually not just argue but strongly argue that the two are in fact very much related and even go so far as saying they're dependent on each other um you know if i were to write a book a week i would get slowly better right um because i mean sorry not a book a week (laughs) a book a year (laughs) Mm -hmm. big difference there if i were to write a book a year i would i would slowly improve every year year upon year but when we're writing at the volume that we're writing and, and and gradually getting better with every project um you know it's we're constantly improving we're always in flow we never ever break out of that so Mm -hmm. um so it's not like we have to find our voice or find ourselves we're just storytellers and between me and johnny and dave we're always telling a few stories at any given time and so we're just really fluent in the the rhythm of a well-told story and the language that it takes to grip a reader and keep them on the page. And because we're never having to like unplug and plug back in, we're just, we're always kind of just going forward. So uh, the analogy I would draw here is if you, if you work out a lot, Mm -hmm. you know, and and you decide, okay, I'm going to take a month off. Oh man, that first Monday after you've taken a month off, Mm -hmm. going to the gym is hard. Like good luck, good luck getting to the gym that day. And that's the way it is for writing for me. If I, if I unplug, you know, for a month, then writing again is very, very, very difficult. But I wrote for a stretch between, um, I want to say June of 2013 and November. And I wrote for, um, for, for two hours each day, uh, through that whole time. Mm -hmm. And at first I was doing about a thousand to 1500 words, um, 
you know, on a, on a good hour. And by the end, because I was just so in flow, I would never, ever, ever get less than like 5,000 words for that two hour block. Mm -hmm. And that's just because I had trained my brain. Now I've unplugged since then and I'm not producing that kind of word count because most of what I do is actually in the Mm pre-production stage right now. And so I'm not, I'm not making those raw words. But but Johnny is and he's very, very consistent. And that's why, you know, that's why he's able to produce that way because he doesn't unplug. Okay, I see. Well, it's it's just, you know, besides the productivity, I also see a very interesting and good example of cooperation. And um, I I can say that it's very common, to be honest, because I don't I mean, every author has his own pace, his own style, and uh, not always it's easy to to write with other authors especially to write the same book so what's i mean uh, how is it can, can you explain how the process goes and how did you decide to write like these three authors together uh, how did the idea come uh well dave and i have always worked together um I, I met dave about a week after i went online for the first time <laughs> so we've just kind of been friends forever and Writing together was just very natural, and we used to um, when back in the the hunting for work days, we used to share a lot of copy jobs, and so we always had that that working relationship. And when it was time to write fiction, there was nobody I'd rather write fiction with. And I I'm a big believer in one plus one equaling three or more, not just two. Mm-hmm. And so um, you know, but but it but it takes a good working relationship, and it it, it really requires knowing what you're good at and, um, and, and, and not having any ego. So like with Dave and I, I don't, I don't bring any ego to the table and neither does Dave. We just want to make the best story possible. Mm-hmm. So if I write something and it sucks, Dave has no problem telling me. And, um, and that means that we can go faster, you know, and, uh, um, we're just, we're always on each other about things that we could do better. And so our work is constantly growing now, working with Dave is totally, totally, totally different than working with Johnny. Dave is much more of a, a, a true artist. Things take longer. Things have to gestate. You know, uh, Johnny and I, um, our systems, just like we bake marketing into our stuff, we also bake um, systems into our stuff. Mm-hmm. So we, we bake restrictions into our stuff. So Fiction Unboxed, you know. We the, the parameters on that were very, very difficult. We were supposed to write a book without even knowing our genre or our characters or anything. And yet when we were done after the 30 days, we had one of our most sophisticated worlds that we'd ever put together. And uh, and that's pretty remarkable. And the, the project that we immediately followed that with um, is called Axis of Aaron. And it's our literary book. It's not a series. It's not a serial it's nothing like that. It's just a straight novel. Mm-hmm. And within that context, it's it's the most complicated, most layered um, thing that we've ever done. And so we we would not have been capable of that book last year. And this year we were. And it's because we get better each time. And it's because the speed makes us better. Yeah, it's a learning curve, right? So with, with yeah, every absolutely. next book... It becomes better, yeah. You also mentioned that, and I and I completely agree because I I also prefer writing fiction. That uh, you know, fiction is much more exciting to write, and nonfiction is quite boring. So, um, but but you do both. I I know that you you've written both. Oh yeah, but even our our nonfiction it reads like fiction. So we just finished the fiction unboxed book actually, which is coming out December third. And it's um, it's the sequel to write, publish, repeat. You know, it's it's more geared toward fiction authors, and you know what they could learn about writing fast and writing well and writing collaboratively. A lot of the stuff we're talking about right now, actually. Mm-hmm. But um, despite the fact that it's a nonfiction book, it talks about the Kickstarter and the actual you know um, process of the the fiction unbox project and that and that book, the Dream Engine. But um, even though it's nonfiction with a lot of very actionable takeaways. It's done like a story. Like you, you, you turn the pages like you're reading fiction because it's mm-hmm. exciting and you want to know what's happening to the characters. Uh huh. I see. And do you agree that all the fiction is more exciting to write, but it's harder than writing nonfiction? Do Do I agree that it's harder than writing fiction nonfiction? Yeah. 
No, I think it's much harder to market, but I think fiction is way easier to write than nonfiction. Now, I don't think that's true for most people at all, but it's absolutely true for me. And, and that's because um, if something isn't exciting to me um, or if it's less exciting, basically I thrive on enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. So if I, have a, if I have a book that is uh, – like the Dream Engine is, would be difficult to write, but um, – but write, publish, repeat would be more difficult to write because it, it's, very, it's facts, it's linear, everything has to be in a very certain order. You know, fiction is just making stuff up and making it entertaining. And yeah, you have to make sure all your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed and you don't have gaping plot holes and your characters are believable and your dialogue doesn't suck and your world, you know, has weight to it and all of that. But, um, but I think that when you tell as many stories as we do, that kind of stuff is just a natural part of your, um, mm -hmm. you, you know, it, it's naturally to what you do. Now, if I wrote nonfiction every day, nonfiction would be easier. But I don't think one is inherently more difficult than the other. I think it just depends on where your brain is and what you're doing with your time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. So do you write in the same genre or are they close to each other at least? Or <laughs> no, no, not even close. Um, I've written in every genre. I've, um, I've, I've, I've written for children. Um, I've written nonfiction. I've written sci-fi. I've written horror. I've written fantasy. Um, I've even dabbled in erotica. I've written everything. Wow. And do you have a, a preferred genre in that case? Since you um, tried I, everything already. No, I, I really don't. I love telling stories and I think it's a matter of what story do I want to tell and what's the best voice to tell it in. Um, I, I really like um, the, 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 the imprint. Our, our company, Sterling and Stone, has six different imprints. And the imprint that I just love to pieces is Realm and Sands because we don't have a specific genre. And so our stories are really, really varied. And that's where the Dream Engine was born. That's where, uh, that's where, where uh, um, Axis of Aaron, our literary book, was born. So there's, there's just a lot of variance in the – it's the voice that is the common denominator there. The, the stories thematically are, are all over the place, and I really like that. So while I love writing with Dave at the Inkwell, um, and that's all horror and sci-fi, and – I, as a reader, I would I, I would really love Roman Sands just because we're, the the way that Johnny and I write, it's almost like we we do want to tell a story certainly, and we do care about what happens to the characters in that story, and we want to make sure that everything is resolved and the hero has his journey and the reader has a great time. But in addition to all of that, we write those stories to explain the world to ourselves. So, um, you know, we have a lot of big questions and big life questions, and we use our fiction to kind of explain the world to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's, that's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful way to write, I think. And it makes those stories much more interesting to me and much more resonant to me. Where Collective Inkwell stuff is really fun to read, it's really fun to write, but it's, it's a little more popcorn. You know, it's a little more like like it's just a fun movie. Um, and so I, I think and it's it's really interesting to me how quickly um, the the Roman Sands line seems to be growing. You know, I, I like that a lot. I like to see how thematically we keep stretching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's, it's just very interesting because uh, now when I'm thinking Many, many writers, usually what they recommend, and I, you know, not only writers, like people from the self-publishing world, they usually say that you should stick to the same genre. And now you're kind of, you know, completely proved <laughs> this. Oh, well, no, no, no. I'd like to clarify, <laughs> actually, that is the best advice. We always couch that by saying, um, you know, uh, this is an advice. <laughs> you know, don't do what we do. Don't do this at home, kids. Because that's that's the truth of it, you know. It's it's that um, just because that works for us, um, it, it's also okay. So it does work for us because it's in alignment with our long term goals. But the truth of the matter is, like, if we wanted to make more money more immediately, we would write in the same genre over and over. So that decision is a creative decision and it's a long-term decision because we want to be known as storytellers more than genre authors. And so, but, but it's not the best decision for getting attention 
or for building an, a brand or for making money. For, for all of those reasons, it's actually the wrong thing to do. Okay, I see. Okay, so I will rephrase it. I mean, when, when I was getting that advice, I was thinking that the other way is like, you know, a big no and it's a definite failure. But that's not the case. So apparently, you know, it depends on on who's doing it and why he's doing it. Because apparently, I mean, of course, you're, you could do uh, more, you could make more money and do much better if you stick to one genre, but it's not like you're doing that, right? So it still works for you. No, and that's, <laughs> that's how I feel. Like I, I have enough to, um, I'm just, I'm not driven by money. Like I like selling books, sure. Um, but I feel like I'm going to make more money every year than the year before because I'm going to constantly produce. So why be in a hurry when what matters to me at the end of my life is legacy and, you know, what worlds I've built and what things I've created and the things that I've said through my art. And that all just matters so much more than any immediate revenue. So it's just, that's just, just not as important to me. I want to be happy with what I write. Um, I want people to be touched. I want to write things that make people feel or think, and um, and and you know, being fenced in by genre is just a, a, a it's just a terrible way to make those creative decisions. Mm-hmm, I see, and uh, I think that uh, you know, as long as you make enough money to be able to write full time. That's just, you know, the, the best that could happen. And later on, it will get even better <laughs> with the yeah. time. So, yeah. I totally agree. <laughs> okay. So, since I touched this, and this will be the last question since I touched this point, um, I have many listeners, and I was one of those who actually was working full time in different jobs, even successful corporate jobs, which we didn't like. Um, we would eventually prefer to become full-time writers, but since you don't make money with that in the very beginning, you can't really afford quitting. And you get this dilemma because if you don't quit, you don't have enough time to write and things like that. So you end up like you know, <laughs> going in circles and not really doing anything uh, productive about this. So imagine someone in that situation what would you advise um well that that that's hard because i actually did the stupid thing and just jumped in without looking well that's uh, what i did as well <laughs> yeah but i think that's a mistake yeah. <laughs> for most people that's a mistake i think what you want to do is just be consistent i think that's the most important thing um you know five minutes a day if that's all you can write like at least it's five minutes a day but if you think that oh i only have five minutes a day like if you say i can't fit five minutes a day then you're either lying to yourself or you shouldn't even try writing because if you can't find five minutes a day then this is clearly the wrong career for you Mm -hmm. it's even clearly the wrong hobby for you i agree (laughs) but but for, for but five minutes a day everyone can find five minutes a day and if that's all you can do, then still, dude, that's that's 35 minutes a week. You know, it's a couple hours a month and that adds up. And once you get used to doing five minutes a day without fail, you can add, make it 10. You can make it 20. You know, I, 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 for a long time, I've been pretty unhealthy. Uh, I've been healthy for a lot of my life. But since I started writing, I just sit all day and it's the worst ever. Yeah. You know, I, I'm just not moving like I should. And I, I kept making the excuse, I've got too much to write. I've got too much to manage. I have too much email. I don't. I can't go walk. But th- that's stupid. It's a lie. It's a lie I tell myself because I don't want to get up and go walk. So now, like I'm, I'm walking every day. And and am I walking as much as I need to? No. Am I exercising as much as I need to? No. But I've done it every day for like forty days, and it's just it's a short walk. But at least I'm doing it, and I can do more later. Mm-hmm. And I think I think writing is the same thing. You know, pick. Don't, the problem a lot of writers fall into is that either they say, oh, I can only do five minutes a day, so it, why bother? Mm-hmm. And then you're getting a why bother result. You know, Your outcome is going to be n- less than nothing because you put nothing into it. And so you can, either, um, uh, you, you can either try harder and say, okay, if I only have five minutes, I have five minutes, and then let those five minutes stack up to 35 each week. Um, or you can just, you know, give up, which is way, 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 way worse. So um, I just say be consistent. Pick a time that you can do every day. Be consistent as you possibly can be and then add to it. You know, put a little more weight on on uh, each week. Yeah, 
Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for the advice, for, for the interesting conversation and for the time you dedicated to me and to my listeners. Oh, my pleasure. Well, I thought that that was it for today. But a few days after I recorded this interview, I came across Sean Platz and his peer writers initiative, which I'm absolutely certain that I have to share with you. And the initiative is called Indie Author Power Pack, and it contains four really awesome things for indie writers. The first thing is the book Write, Publish, Repeat, about which we already spoke during the interview. The second thing is the book, well, actually the updated second edition of the book called Let's Get Digital by David Gohram. I really hope I pronounced it right. And the third book in the pack is called How to Market a Book and it's written by Joanna Pan, whom I interviewed in the previous episode. The fourth thing uh, on top of all these three books is a brand new bonus mastermind section featuring all four of the writers who created writing, publishing and marketing for independent authors. That comes in the form of polished transcript, a video version and an audio version. So the good news is that it's an extremely valuable package for especially indie authors and you will get over 1000 pages of valuable information. The second good news is that it's only 99 cents right now. And I will put all the links to the pack where you can get it, including Amazon and other book selling sites. Uh, so I would encourage you to go and grab those because it's extreme value for the price. You can get all those links in the show notes at www.annealexander.com slash 43 or in the notes at iTunes. So I guess that's it. Tomorrow is the very last preparatory day before the NaNoWriMo starts. So make sure you organize your thoughts, you get the idea for the book and you're emotionally ready for the challenge. I uh, still don't have an idea for my book. I will definitely keep you updated in the next episode what I did and how I started. And hopefully you will share your NaNoWriMo more reports with me as well. Take care and see you in the next episode.